The Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Anne Catherine Emerick Chapter 2 Judas and His Band Judas had not expected that his treason would have produced such fatal results. He had been anxious to obtain the promised reward and to please the Pharisees by delivering up Jesus into their hands, but he had never calculated on things going so far, or thought that the enemies of his master would actually bring him to judgment and crucify him. His mind was engrossed with the love of gain alone, and some astute Pharisees and Sadducees, with whom he had established an intercourse, had constantly urged him on to treason by flattering him. He was sick of the fatiguing, wandering, and persecuted life which the apostles led. For several months past, he had continually stolen from the alms which were consigned to his care, and his avarice, grudging the expenses incurred by Magdalene when she poured the precious ointment on the feet of our Lord, incited him to the commission of the greatest of crimes. He had always hoped that Jesus would establish a temporal kingdom and bestow upon him some brilliant and lucrative post in it, but finding himself disappointed, he turned his thoughts to amassing a fortune. He saw that sufferings and persecutions were on the increase for our Lord and his followers, and he sought to make friends with the powerful enemies of our Savior before the time of danger, for he saw that Jesus did not become a king, whereas the actual dignity and power of the high priest, and of all who were attached to his service, made a very strong impression upon his mind. He began to enter by degrees into a close connection with their agents, who were constantly flattering him, and assuring him in strong terms, that in any case, an end would speedily be put to the career of our divine Lord. He listened more and more eagerly to the criminal suggestions of his corrupt heart, and he had done nothing during the last few days but go backwards and forwards in order to induce the chief priests to come to some agreement. But they were unwilling to act at once and treated him with contempt. They said that sufficient time would not intervene before the festival day and that there will be a tumult among the people. The Sanhedrin alone listened to his proposals with some degree of attention. After Judas had sacrilegiously received the Blessed Sacrament, Satan took entire possession of him, and he went off at once to complete his crime. He, in the first place, sought those persons who had hitherto flattered and entered into agreements with him, and who still received him with pretended friendship. Some others joined the party, and among the number, Annas and Caiaphas, but the latter treated him with considerable pride and scorn. All these enemies of Christ were extremely undecided and far from feeling any confidence of success because they mistrusted Judas. I saw the empire of hell divided against itself. Satan desired the crime of the Jews and earnestly longed for the death of Jesus, the converter of souls the holy teacher, the just man, who was so abhorrent to him. But at the same time, he felt an extraordinary interior fear of the death of the innocent victim, who would not conceal himself from his persecutors. I saw him then, on the one hand, stimulate the hatred and fury of the enemies of Jesus, and on the other, insinuate to some of their number that Judas was a wicked, despicable character, and that the sentence could not be pronounced before the festival, or a sufficient number of witnesses against Jesus be gathered together. Everyone proposed something different, and some questioned Judas, saying, Shall we be able to take him? Has he not armed men with him? And the traitor replied, No, he is alone with eleven disciples. He is greatly depressed, and the eleven are timid men. He told them that now or never was the time to get possession of the person of Jesus, that later he might no longer have it in his power to give our Lord up into their hands, and that perhaps he should never return to him again, because for several days past 
it had been very clear that the other disciples and jesus himself suspected and would certainly kill him if he returned to them he told them likewise that if they did not at once seize the person of Jesus, he would make his escape and return with an army of his partisans to have himself proclaimed king. These threats of Judas produced some effect. His proposals were acceded to, and he received the price of his treason, 30 pieces of silver. These pieces were oblong, with holes in their sides, strung together by means of rings in a kind of chain, and bearing certain impressions. Judas could not help being conscious that they regarded him with contempt and distrust, for their language and gestures betrayed their feelings, and pride suggested to him to give back the money as an offering for the temple, in order to make them suppose his intentions to have been just and disinterested. But they rejected his proposal because the price of blood could not be offered in the temple. Judas saw how much they despised him, and his rage was excessive. He had not expected to reap the bitter fruits of his treason even before it was accomplished, but he had gone so far with these men that he was in their power, and escape was no longer possible. They watched him carefully and would not let him leave their presence until he had shown them exactly what steps were to be taken in order to secure the person of Jesus. Three Pharisees accompanied him when he went down into a room where the soldiers of the temple, some of whom were Jews and the rest various nations, were assembled. When everything was settled and the necessary number of soldiers gathered together, Judas hastened first to the supper room, accompanied by a servant of the Pharisees, for the purpose of ascertaining whether Jesus had left, as they would have seized his person there without difficulty, if once they had secured the doors. He agreed to send them a messenger with the required information. A short time before, when Judas had received the price of his treason, a Pharisee had gone out, and sent seven slaves to fetch wood with which to prepare the cross for our Savior, in case he should be judged, because the next day there would not be sufficient time on account of the commencement of the Paschal festivity. They procured this wood from a spot about three-quarters of a mile distant, near a high wall, where there was a great quantity of other wood belonging to the temple, and dragged it to a square situated behind the tribunal of Caiaphas. The principal piece of the cross came from a tree, formerly growing in the valley of Josephat, near the torrent of Cedron, and which, having fallen across the stream, had been used as a sort of bridge. When Nehemiah hid the sacred fire and the holy vessels in the pool of Bethsaida, it had been thrown over the spot, together with other pieces of wood, then later taken away and left on one side. The cross was prepared in a very peculiar manner, either with the object of deriding the royalty of Jesus, or from what men might term chance. It was composed of five pieces of wood, exclusive of the inscription. I saw many other things concerning the cross, and the meaning of different circumstances was also made known to me, but I have forgotten all of that. Judas returned and said that Jesus was no longer in the supper room, but that he must certainly be on Mount Olivet, in the spot where he was accustomed to pray. He requested that only a small number of men might be sent with him, lest the disciples who were on the watch should perceive anything and raise a sedition. Three hundred men were to be stationed at the gates and in the streets of Ophel, a part of the town situated to the south of the temple, and along the valley of Milo, as far as the house of Annas, on the top of Mount Sion, in order to be ready to send reinforcements if necessary, for he said all the people of the lower class of Ophel were partisans of Jesus. The traitor likewise bade them be careful, lest he should escape them, since he, by mysterious means, had so often hidden himself in the mountain, and made himself suddenly invisible to those around. He recommended them, besides, 
to fasten him with a chain and make use of certain magical forms to prevent his breaking it the jews listened to all these pieces of advice with scornful indifference and replied if we once have him in our hands we will take care not to let him go judas next began to make his arrangements with those who were to accompany him he wished to enter the garden before them and embrace and salute jesus as if he were returning to him as his friend and disciple and then for the soldiers to run forward and seize the person of jesus he was anxious that it should be thought they had come there by chance that so when they had made their appearance he might run away like the other disciples and be no more heard of he likewise thought that perhaps a tumult will ensue that the apostles might defend themselves and jesus pass through the midst of his enemies as he had so often done before he dwelt upon these thoughts especially when his pride was hurt by the disdainful manner of the jews in his regard but he did not repent for he had wholly given himself to satan it was his desire also that the soldiers following him should not carry chains and cords and his accomplices pretended to accede to all his wishes although in reality they acted with him as with a traitor who was not to be trusted but to be cast off as soon as he had done what was wanted the soldiers received orders to keep close to judas watch him carefully and not let him escape until jesus was seized for he had received his reward and it was feared that he might run off with the money and jesus not be taken after all or another be taken in his place the band of men chosen to accompany judas was composed of twenty soldiers selected from the temple guard and from others of the military who were under the orders of annas and caiaphas they were dressed very much like the roman soldiers had morions like them and wore hanging straps round their thighs but their beards were long whereas the roman soldiers at jerusalem had whiskers only and shaved their chins and upper lips they all had swords some of them being also armed with spears and they carried sticks with lanterns and torches but when they set off they only lighted one it had at first been intended that judas should be accompanied by a more numerous escort but he drew their attention to the fact that so large a number of men would be too easily seen because mount olivet commanded a view of the whole valley most of the soldiers remained therefore at ophel and sentinels were stationed on all sides to put down any attempt which might be made to release jesus judas set off with the twenty soldiers but he was followed at some distance by four archers who were only common bailiffs carrying cords and chains and after them came the six agents with whom judas had been in communication for some time one of these was a priest and a confidant of annas a second was devoted to caiaphas the third and fourth were pharisees and the other two sadduceans and herodians these six men were courtiers of annas and caiaphas acting in the capacity of spies and most bitter enemies of jesus the soldiers remained on friendly terms with judas until they reached the spot where the road divides the garden of olives from the garden of gethsemane but there they refused to allow him to advance alone and entirely changed their manner treating him with much insolence and harshness chapter three jesus is arrested jesus was standing with his three apostles on the road between gethsemane and the garden of olives when judas and the band who accompanied him made their appearance a warm dispute arose between judas and the soldiers because he wished to approach first and speak to jesus quietly as if nothing was the matter and then for them to come up and seize our savior thus letting him suppose that he had no connection with the affair but the men answered rudely not so friend thou shalt not escape from our hands until we have the galilean safely bound 
and seeing the eight apostles who hastened to rejoin Jesus when they heard the dispute which was going on. They, notwithstanding the opposition of Judas, called up four archers, whom they had left at a little distance, to assist. When by the light of the moon, Jesus and the three apostles first saw the band of armed men, Peter wished to repel them by force of arms, and said, Lord, the other eight are close at hand. Let us attack the archers. But Jesus bade him hold his peace, and then turned and walked back a few steps. At this moment, four disciples came out of the garden and asked what was taking place. Judas was about to reply, but the soldiers interrupted and would not let him speak. These four disciples were James the Less, Philip, Thomas, and Nathaniel. The last named, who was the son of the aged Simeon, had with a few others joined the eight apostles at Gethsemane, being perhaps sent by the friends of Jesus to know what was going on, or possibly simply incited by curiosity and anxiety. The other disciples were wandering to and fro on the lookout and ready to fly at a moment's notice. Jesus walked up to the soldiers and said in a firm and clear voice, Whom seek ye? The leader answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Scarcely had he pronounced these words than they all fell to the ground as if struck with apoplexy. Judas, who stood by them, was much alarmed, and as he appeared desirous of approaching, Jesus held out his hand and said, Friend, whereto art thou come? Judas stammered forth something about business which had brought him. Jesus answered in few words, the sense of which was, It were better for thee that thou hast never been born. However, I cannot remember the words exactly. In the meantime, the soldiers had risen and again approached Jesus, but they waited for the sign of the kiss with which Judas had promised to salute his master that they might recognize him. Peter and the other disciples surrounded Judas and reviled him in unmeasured terms, calling him thief and traitor. He tried to mollify their wrath by all kinds of lies, but his efforts were vain, for the soldiers came up and offered to defend him, which proceeding manifested the truth at once. Jesus again asked, Whom seek ye? They replied, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus made answer, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. At these words, the soldiers fell for the second time to the ground in convulsions similar to those of epilepsy, and the apostles again surrounded Judas and expressed their indignation at his shameful treachery. Jesus said to the soldiers, Arise. And they arose, but at first quite speechless with terror. They then told Judas to give them the signal agreed upon instantly, as their orders were to seize upon no one but him whom Judas kissed. Judas therefore approached Jesus and gave him a kiss, saying, Hail, Rabbi! Jesus replied, What, Judas, dost thou betray the Son of Man with a kiss? The soldiers immediately surrounded Jesus, and the archers laid hands upon him. Judas wished to fly, but the apostles would not allow it. They rushed at the soldiers and cried out, Master, shall we strike with the sword? Peter, who was more impetuous than the rest, seized the sword and struck Malchus, the servant of the high priest, who wished to drive away the apostles and cut off his right ear. Malchus fell to the ground, and a great tumult ensued. The archers had seized upon Jesus and wished to bind him, while Malchus and the rest of the soldiers stood around. When Peter struck the former, the rest were occupied in repulsing those among the disciples who approached too near, and in pursuing some who ran away. Four disciples made their appearance in the distance, and looked fearfully at the scene before them, but the soldiers were still too much alarmed at their late fall to trouble themselves much about them, and besides, 
they did not wish to leave our Savior without a certain number of men to guard him. Judas fled as soon as he had given the traitorous kiss, but was met by some of the disciples, who overwhelmed him with reproaches. Six Pharisees, however, came to his rescue, and he escaped, whilst the archers were busily occupied in pinioning Jesus. When Peter struck Malchus, Jesus said to him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot ask my father, and he will give me presently more than twelve legions of angels? How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that so it must be done? Then he said, Let me cure this man. And approaching Malchus, he touched his ear, prayed, and it was healed. The soldiers who were standing near, as well as the archers and the six Pharisees, far from being moved by this miracle, continued to insult our Lord, and said to the bystanders, It is a trick of the devil. The powers of witchcraft made the ear appear to be cut off, and now the same power gives it the appearance of being healed. Then Jesus again addressed them, you are come out, as it were, to a robber, with swords and clubs, to apprehend me. I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you laid not hands upon me. But this is your hour, and the power of darkness. The Pharisees ordered him to be bound still more strongly, and made answer in a contemptuous tone. Ah, thou couldst not overthrow us by thy witchcraft. Jesus replied, but I do not remember his words, and all the disciples fled. The four archers and the six Pharisees did not fall to the ground at the words of Jesus, because, as was afterwards revealed to me, they as well as Judas, who likewise did not fall, were entirely in the power of Satan, whereas all those who fell and rose again were afterwards converted and became Christians, they had only surrounded Jesus and not laid hands upon him. Malchus was instantly converted by the cure wrought upon him, and during the time of the Passion, his employment was to carry messages backwards and forwards to Mary and the other friends of our Lord. The archers, who now proceeded to pinion Jesus with the greatest brutality, were pagans of the lowest extract, short, stout, and active, with sandy complexions, resembling those of Egyptian slaves, and bare legs, arms, and neck. They tied his hands as tightly as possible with hard new cords, fastening the right hand wrist under the left elbow, and the left hand wrist under the right elbow. They encircled his waist with a species of belt studded with iron points, and bound his hands to it with osier bands, while on his neck they put a collar covered with iron points, and to this collar was appended two leathern straps, which were crossed over his chest like a stole and fastened to the belt. They then fastened four ropes to different parts of the belt, and by means of these ropes dragged our blessed Lord from side to side in the most cruel manner. Their ropes were new. I think they were purchased when the Pharisees first determined to arrest Jesus. The Pharisees lighted fresh torches, and the procession started. Ten soldiers walked in front. The archers who held the ropes and dragged Jesus along followed, and the Pharisees and ten other soldiers brought up the rear. The disciples wandered about at a distance, and wept and moaned, as if beside themselves with grief. John alone followed, and walked at no great distance from the soldiers, until the Pharisees, seeing him, ordered the guards to arrest him. They endeavored to obey, but he ran away, leaving in their hands a cloth with which he was covered, and of which they had taken hold when they endeavored to seize him. He had slipped off his coat, that he might escape more easily from the hands of his enemies, and kept nothing on but a short undergarment without sleeves, and the long band which the Jews usually wore, and which was wrapped round his neck, head, and arms. The archers behaved in the most cruel manner to Jesus, as they led him along. This they did to curry favor with the six Pharisees, 
who they well knew perfectly hated and detested our Lord. They led him along the roughest roads they could select, over the sharpest stones, and through the thickest mire. They pulled the cords as tightly as possible. They struck him with knotted cords, as a butcher would strike the beast he is about to slaughter. They accompanied this cruel treatment with such ignoble and indecent insults that I cannot recount them. The feet of Jesus were bare. He wore, besides the ordinary dress, a seamless woolen garment and a cloak which was thrown over all. I have forgotten to state that when Jesus was arrested, it was done without any order being presented or legal ceremony taking place. He was treated as a person without the pale of the law. The procession proceeded at a good pace. When they left the road, which runs between the Garden of Olives and that of Gethsemane, they turned to the right and soon reached the bridge, which was thrown over the torrent of Cedron. When Jesus went to the Garden of Olives with the apostles, he did not cross this bridge, but went by a private path, which ran through the valley of Josephat and led to another bridge more to the south. The bridge over which the soldiers led Jesus was long, being thrown over not only the torrent, which was very large in this part, but likewise over the valley, which extends a considerable distance to the right and to the left, and is much lower than the bed of the river. I saw our Lord fall twice before he reached the bridge, and these falls were caused entirely by the barbarous manner in which the soldiers dragged him. But when they were half over the bridge, they gave full vent to their brutal inclinations, and struck Jesus with such violence that they threw him off the bridge into the water, and scornfully recommended him to quench his thirst there. If God had not preserved him, he must have been killed by this fall. He fell first on his knees, and then on his face, but saved himself a little by stretching out his hands, which, although so tightly bound before, were loosened. I know not whether by a miracle, or whether the soldiers had cut the cords before they threw him into the water. The marks of his feet, his elbows and his fingers, were miraculously impressed on the rocks on which he fell, and these impressions were afterwards shown for the veneration of Christians. These stones were less hard than the unbelieving hearts of the wicked men who surrounded Jesus, and bore witness at this terrible moment to the divine power which had touched them. I had not seen Jesus take anything to quench the thirst, which had consumed him ever since his agony in the garden, but he drank when he fell into the cedron, and I heard him repeat these words from the prophetic psalm. In his thirst he will drink water from the torrent. Psalm 108 The archers still held the ends of the ropes with which Jesus was bound, but as it would have been difficult to drag him out of the water on that side, on account of a wall which was built on the shore, they turned back and dragged him quite through the cedron to the shore, and then made him cross the bridge a second time, accompanying their every action with insults, blasphemies, and blows. His long woolen garment, which was quite soaked through, adhered to his legs, impeding every movement, and rendered it almost impossible for him to walk, and when he reached the end of the bridge, he fell quite down. They pulled him up again in the most cruel manner, struck him with cords, and fastened the ends of his wet garment to the belt, abusing him at the same time in the most cowardly manner. It was not quite midnight when I saw the four archers inhumanly drag Jesus over a narrow path, which was choked up with stones, fragments of rocks, thistles, and thorns on the opposite shore of the Cedron. The six brutal Pharisees walked as close to our Lord as they could, struck him constantly with thick pointed sticks, and seeing that his bare and bleeding feet were torn by the stones and briars, exclaimed scornfully, His precursor, John the Baptist, has certainly not prepared a good path for him here. Or, The words of Malachi, Behold, I send my angel before thy face, to prepare the way before thee, do not exactly apply now. 
every jest uttered by these men incited the archers to greater cruelty the enemies of jesus remarked that several persons made their appearance in the distance they were only disciples who had assembled when they heard that their master was arrested and who were anxious to discover what the end would be but the sight of them rendered the pharisees uneasy lest any attempt should be made to rescue jesus and they therefore sent for a reinforcement of soldiers at a very short distance from an entrance opposite to the south side of the temple which leads through a little village called ophel to mount sion where the residences of annas and caiaphas were situated i saw a band of about fifty soldiers who carried torches and appeared ready for anything the demeanor of these men was outrageous and they gave loud shouts both to announce their arrival and to congratulate their comrades upon the success of the expedition this caused a slight confusion among the soldiers who were leading jesus and malchus and a few others took advantage of it to depart and fly towards mount olivet when the fresh band of soldiers left ophel i saw those disciples who had gathered together disperse some went one way and some another the blessed virgin and about nine of the holy women being filled with anxiety directed their steps towards the valley of josephat accompanied by lazarus john the son of mark the son of veronica and the son of simon the last named was at gethsemane with nathaniel and the eight apostles and had fled when the soldiers appeared he was giving the blessed virgin the account of all that had been done when the fresh band of soldiers joined those who were leading jesus and she then heard their tumultuous vociferations and saw the light of the torches they carried this sight quite overcame her she became insensible and john took her into the house of mary the mother of mark the fifty soldiers who were sent to join those who had taken jesus were a detachment from a company of three hundred men posted to guard the gates and environs of ophel for the traitor judas had reminded the high priests that the inhabitants of ophel who were principally of the laboring class and whose chief employment was to bring water and wood to the temple were the most attached partisans of jesus and might perhaps make some attempts to rescue him the traitor was aware that jesus had both consoled instructed assisted and cured the diseases of many of these poor working men and that ophel was the place where he halted during his journey from bethany to hebron when john the baptist had just been executed judas also knew that jesus had cured many of the masons who were injured by the fall of the tower of silo the greatest part of the inhabitants of ophel were converted after the death of our lord and joined the first christian community that was formed after pentecost and when the christians separated from the jews and erected new dwellings they placed their huts and tents in the valley which is situated between mount olivet and ophel and there saint stephen lived ophel was on a hill to the south of the temple surrounded by walls and its inhabitants were very poor i think it was smaller than dolmen the slumbers of the good inhabitants of ophel were disturbed by the noise of the soldiers they came out of their houses and ran to the entrance of the village to ask the cause of the uproar but the soldiers received them roughly ordered them to return home and in reply to their numerous questions said we have just arrested jesus your false prophet he who has deceived you so grossly the high priests are about to judge him and he will be crucified cries and lamentations arose on all sides the poor women and children ran backwards and forwards weeping and wringing their hands and calling to mind all the benefits they had received from our lord they cast themselves on their knees to implore the protection of heaven but the soldiers pushed them on one side struck them and obliged them to return to their houses and exclaimed what further proof is required does not the conduct of these persons show plainly that the galilean incites rebellion 
they were however a little cautious in their expressions and demeanour for fear of causing an insurrection in ophel and therefore only endeavoured to drive the inhabitants away from those parts of the village which jesus was obliged to cross when the cruel soldiers who led our lord were near the gates of ophel he again fell and appeared unable to proceed a step further upon which one among them being moved to compassion said to another you see the poor man is perfectly exhausted he cannot support himself with the weight of his chains if we wish to get him to the high priest alive we must loosen the cords with which his hands are bound that he may be able to save himself a little when he falls the band stopped for a moment the fetters were loosened and another kind-hearted soldier brought some water to jesus from a neighboring fountain jesus thanked him and spoke of the fountains of living water of which those who believed in him should drink but his words enraged the pharisees still more and they overwhelmed him with insults and contumelious language i saw the heart of the soldier who had caused jesus to be unbound as also that of the one who brought him water suddenly illuminated by grace they were both converted before the death of jesus and immediately joined his disciples the procession started again and reached the gate of ophel here jesus was again saluted by the cries of grief and sympathy of those who owed him so much gratitude and the soldiers had considerable difficulty in keeping back the men and women who crowded round from all parts they clasped their hands fell on their knees lamented and exclaimed release this man unto us release him who will assist who will console us who will cure our diseases release him unto us it was indeed heart-rending to look upon jesus his face was white disfigured and wounded his hair disheveled his dress wet and soiled and his savage and drunken guards were dragging him about and striking him with sticks like a dumb animal led to the slaughter thus was he conducted through the midst of the afflicted inhabitants of ophel and the paralytic whom he had cured the dumb to whom he had restored speech and the blind whose eyes he had opened united but in vain in offering supplications for his release many persons from among the lowest and most degraded classes had been sent by annas caiaphas and the other enemies of jesus to join the procession and assist the soldiers both in ill-treating jesus and in driving away the inhabitants of ophel the village of ophel was seated upon a hill and i saw a great deal of timber placed there ready for building the procession had to proceed down a hill and then passed through a door made in the wall on one side of this door stood a large building erected originally by solomon and on the other side the pool of bethsaida after passing this they followed a westerly direction down a steep street called milo at the end of which a turn to the south brought them to the house of annas the guards never ceased their cruel treatment of our divine saviour and excused such conduct by saying that the crowds who gathered together in front of the procession compelled them to severity jesus fell seven times between mount olivet and the house of annas the inhabitants of ophel were still in a state of consternation and grief when the sight of the blessed virgin who passed through the village accompanied by the holy women and some other friends on her way from the valley of cedron to the house of mary the mother of mark excited them still more and they made the place re-echo with sobs and lamentations while they surrounded and almost carried her in their arms mary was speechless from grief and did not open her lips after she reached the house of mary the mother of mark until the arrival of john who related all he had seen since jesus left the supper room and a little later she was taken to the house of martha which was near that of lazarus peter and john who had followed jesus at a distance went in haste to some servants of the high priest with whom the latter was acquainted 
in order to endeavor by their means to obtain admittance into the tribunal where their master was to be tried these servants acted as messengers and had just been ordered to go to the houses of the ancients and other members of the council to summon them to attend the meeting which was convoked as they were anxious to oblige the apostles but foresaw much difficulty in obtaining their admittance into the tribunal they gave them cloaks similar to those they themselves wore and made them assist in carrying messages to the members in order that afterwards they might enter the tribunal of caiaphas and mingle without being recognized among the soldiers and false witnesses as all other persons were to be expelled as nicodemus joseph of arimathea and other well-intentioned persons were members of this council the apostles undertook to let them know what was going to be done in the council thus securing the presence of those friends of jesus whom the pharisees had purposely omitted to invite in the meantime judas wandered up and down the steep and wild precipices at the south of jerusalem despair marked on his every feature and the devil pursuing him to and fro filling his imagination with still darker visions and not allowing him a moment's respite chapter four means employed by the enemies of jesus for carrying out their designs against him no sooner was jesus arrested than annas and caiaphas were informed and instantly began to arrange their plans with regard to the course to be pursued confusion speedily reigned everywhere the rooms were lighted up in haste guards placed at the entrances and messengers dispatched to different parts of the town to convoke the members of the council the scribes and all who were to take part in the trial many among them had however assembled at the house of caiaphas as soon as the treacherous compact with judas was completed and had remained there to await the course of events the different classes of ancients were likewise assembled and as the pharisees sadducees and herodians were congregated in jerusalem from all parts of the country for the celebration of the festival and had long been concerning measures for the arrest of our lord the high priest now sent for those whom they knew to be most bitterly opposed to jesus and desired them to assemble the witnesses gather together every possible proof and bring all before the council the proud sadducees of nazareth of capernaum of thurza of gabara of jatapata and of silo whom jesus had so often reproved before the people were perfectly dying for revenge they hastened to all the inns to seek out those persons whom they knew to be enemies of our lord and offered them bribes in order to secure their appearance but with the exception of a few ridiculous calumnies which were certain to be disproved as soon as investigated nothing tangible could be brought forward against jesus excepting indeed those foolish accusations which he had so often refuted in the synagogue the enemies of jesus hastened however to the tribunal of caiaphas escorted by the scribes and pharisees of jerusalem and accompanied by many of those merchants whom our lord drove out of the temple when they were holding market there as also by the proud doctors whom he had silenced before all the people and even by some who could not forgive the humiliation of being convicted of error when he disputed with them in the temple at the age of twelve there was likewise a large body of impenitent sinners whom he had refused to cure relapsed sinners whose diseases had returned worldly young men whom he would not receive as disciples avaricious persons whom he had enraged by causing the money which they had been in hopes of possessing to be distributed in alms others there were whose friends he had cured and who had thus been disappointed in their expectations of inheriting property debauchees whose victims he had converted and many despicable characters who made their fortunes by flattering and fostering the vices of the great 
All these emissaries of Satan were overflowing with rage against everything holy, and consequently with an indescribable hatred of the holy of the holies. They were further incited by the enemies of our Lord, and therefore assembled in crowds round the palace of Caiaphas to bring forward all their false accusations and to endeavor to cover with infamy that spotless lamb who took upon himself the sins of the world and accepted the burden in order to reconcile man with God. Whilst all these wicked beings were busily consulting as to what was best to be done, anguish and anxiety filled the hearts of the friends of Jesus, for they were ignorant of the mystery which was about to be accomplished, and they wandered about, sighing, and listening to every different opinion. Each word they uttered gave rise to feelings of suspicion on the part of those whom they addressed, and if they were silent, their silence was set down as wrong. Many well-meaning, but weak and undecided characters, yielded to temptation, were scandalized, and lost their faith. Indeed, the number of those who persevered was very small indeed. Things were the same then as they oftentimes are now. Persons were willing to serve God if they met with no opposition from their fellow creatures, but were ashamed of the cross if held in contempt by others. The hearts of some were, however, touched by the patience displayed by our Lord in the midst of his sufferings, and they walked away silent and sad. Chapter 5. A Glance at Jerusalem The customary prayers and preparations for the celebration of the festival being completed, the greatest part of the inhabitants of the densely populated city of Jerusalem, as also the strangers congregated there, were plunged in sleep after the fatigues of the day, when all at once the arrest of Jesus was announced, and every one was aroused, both his friends and foes, and numbers immediately responded to the summons of the high priest, and left their dwellings to assemble at his court. In some parts, the light of the moon enabled them to grope their way in safety along the dark and gloomy streets, but in other parts, they were obliged to make use of torches. Very few of the houses were built with their windows looking on the street, and generally speaking, their doors were in inner courts, which gave the streets a still more gloomy appearance than is usual at this hour. The steps of all were directed towards Sion, and an attentive listener might have heard persons stop at the doors of their friends and knock in order to awaken them, then hurry on, then again stop to question others, and finally set off anew in haste towards Sion. Newsmongers and servants were hurrying forward to ascertain what was going on in order that they might return and give the account to those who remained at home, and the bolting and barricading of doors might be plainly heard, as many persons were much alarmed and feared an insurrection, while a thousand different propositions were made and opinions given, such as the following. Lazarus and his sisters will soon know who is this man in whom they have placed such firm reliance. Joanna Cusa, Susanna, Mary the mother of Mark, and Salome will repent, but too late, the imprudence of their conduct. Seraphia, the wife of Sirach, will be compelled to make an apology to her husband now, for he has so often reproached her with her partiality for the Galilean. The partisans of this fanatical man, this inciter of rebellion, pretended to be filled with compassion for all who looked upon things in a different light from themselves, and now they will not know where to hide their heads. He will find no more now to cast garments and strew olive branches at his feet, those hypocrites who pretended to be so much better than other persons will receive their deserts, for they are all implicated with the Galilean. It is a much more serious business than was at first thought. I should like to know how Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea will get out of it. The high priests have mistrusted them for some time. 
they make common cause with Lazarus, but they are extremely cunning. All will now, however, be brought to light. Speeches such as these were uttered by persons who were exasperated, not only against the disciples of Jesus, but likewise with the holy women who had supplied his temporal wants and had publicly and fearlessly expressed their veneration for his doctrines and their belief in his divine mission. But although many persons spoke of Jesus and his followers in this contemptuous manner, yet there were others who held very different opinions, and of these some were frightened, and others, being overcome with sorrow, sought friends to whom they might unburden their hearts, and before whom they could, without fear, give vent to their feelings, but the number of those sufficiently daring, openly to avow their admiration for Jesus, was but small. Nevertheless, it was in parts only of Jerusalem that these disturbances took place, in those parts where the messengers had been sent by the high priests and the Pharisees to convoke the members of the council and to call together the witnesses. It appeared to me that I saw feelings of hatred and fury burst forth in different parts of the city under the form of flames, which flames traversed the streets, united with others which they met, and proceeded in the direction of Sion, increasing every moment, and at last came to a stop beneath the tribunal of Caiaphas, where they remained, forming together a perfect whirlwind of fire. The Roman soldiers took no part in what was going on. They did not understand the excited feelings of the people, but their sentinels were doubled, their cohorts drawn up, and they kept a strict lookout. This indeed was customary at the time of the Paschal Solemnity, on account of the vast number of strangers who were then assembled together. The Pharisees endeavored to avoid the neighborhood of the sentinels for fear of being questioned by them and of contracting defilement by answering their questions. The high priest had sent a message to Pilate intimating their reasons for stationing soldiers round Ophel and Sion, but he mistrusted their intentions, as much ill-feeling existed between the Romans and the Jews. He could not sleep, but walked about during the greatest part of the night, hearkening to the different reports and issuing orders consequent on what he heard. His wife slept, but her sleep was disturbed by frightful dreams, and she groaned and wept alternately. In no part of Jerusalem did the arrest of Jesus produce more touching demonstrations of grief than among the poor inhabitants of Ophel, the greatest part of whom were day laborers, and the rest principally employed in menial offices in the service of the temple. The news came unexpectedly upon them. For some time they doubted the truth of the report, and wavered between hope and fear. But the sight of their master, their benefactor, their consoler, dragged through the streets, torn, bruised, and ill-treated in every imaginable way, filled them with horror and their grief was still further increased by beholding his afflicted mother wandering about from street to street, accompanied by the holy women, and endeavoring to obtain some intelligence concerning her divine son. These holy women were often obliged to hide in corners and under doorways for fear of being seen by the enemies of Jesus, but even with these precautions they were oftentimes insulted, and taken for women of bad character. Their feelings were frequently harrowed by hearing the malignant words and triumphant expressions of the cruel Jews, and seldom, very seldom, did a word of kindness or pity strike their ears. They were completely exhausted before reaching their place of refuge, but they endeavored to console and support one another, and wrap thick veils over their heads. When at last seated, they heard a sudden knock at the door and listened breathlessly. The knock was repeated, but softly. Therefore they made certain that it was no enemy, and yet they opened the door cautiously, fearing a stratagem. It was indeed a friend, and they eagerly questioned him. 
but derive no consolation from his words. Therefore, unable to rest quiet any longer, they issued forth and walked about for a time, and then again returned to their place of refuge, still more heartbroken than before. The majority of the apostles, overcome with terror, were wandering about among the valleys which surrounded Jerusalem, and at times took refuge in the caverns beneath Mount Olivet. They started if they came in contact with one another, spoke in trembling tones, and separated on the least noise being heard. First they concealed themselves in one cave, and then in another. Next they endeavored to return to the town, while some of their number climbed to the top of Mount Olivet, and cast anxious glances at the torches, the light of which they could see glimmering at and about Sion. They listened to every distant sound, made a thousand different conjectures, and then returned to the valley, in hopes of getting some certain intelligence. The streets in the vicinity of Caiaphas's tribunal were brightly illuminated with lamps and torches, but as the crowds gathered around it, the noise and confusion continued to increase. Mingled with these discordant sounds might be heard the bellowing of the beasts, which were tethered on the outside of the walls of Jerusalem, and the plaintive bleeding of the lambs. There was something most touching in the bleeding of these lambs, which were to be sacrificed on the following day in the temple. The one lamb alone, who was about to be offered a willing sacrifice, opened not his mouth, like a sheep in the hands of the butcher, which resists not, or the lamb which is silent before the shearer. And that lamb is the lamb of God, the lamb without spot, the true paschal lamb, Jesus Christ himself. The sky looked dark, gloomy and threatening. The moon was red and covered with livid spots. It appeared as if dreading to reach its full, because its creator was then to die. Then I cast a glance outside the town, and near the south gate I beheld the traitor, Judas Iscariot, wandering about alone, and a prey to the tortures of his guilty conscience, he feared even his own shadow, and was followed by many devils, who endeavored to turn his feelings of remorse into black despair. The thousands of evil spirits were busying themselves in all parts, tempting men first to one sin, then to another. It appeared as if the gates of hell were flung open, and Satan madly striving and exerting his whole energies, to increase the heavy load of iniquities which the lamb without spot had taken upon himself. The angels waver between joy and grief. They desired ardently to fall prostrate before the throne of God and to obtain permission to assist Jesus, but at the same time they were filled with astonishment and could only adore that miracle of divine justice and mercy which had existed in heaven for all eternity and was now about to be accomplished. For the angels believe like us in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, who began on this night to suffer under Pontius Pilate, and the next day was to be crucified, to die, and be buried descend into hell, rise again on the third day, ascend into heaven, be seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and from thence come to judge the living and the dead. They likewise believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Chapter 6 Jesus Before Annas it was towards midnight when Jesus reached the palace of Annas, and his guards immediately conducted him into a very large hall, where Annas, surrounded by twenty-eight counselors, was seated on a species of platform, raised a little above the level of the floor, and placed opposite to the entrance. The soldiers who first arrested Jesus now dragged him roughly to the foot of the tribunal. The room was quite full, between soldiers, the servants of Annas, 
and a number of the mob who had been admitted, and the false witnesses who afterwards adjourned to Caiaphas's hall. Annas was delighted at the thought of our Lord being brought before him, and was looking out for his arrival with the greatest impatience. The expression of his countenance was most repulsive, as it showed in every lineament not only the infernal joy with which he was filled, but likewise all the cunning and duplicity of his heart. He was the president of a species of tribunal, instituted for the purpose of examining persons accused of teaching false doctrines, and if convicted there, they were then taken before the high priest. Jesus stood before Annas. He looked exhausted and haggard. His garments were covered with mud, his hands manacled, his head bowed down, and he spoke not a word. Annas was a thin, ill-humored-looking old man, with a scraggy beard. His pride and arrogance were great, and as he seated himself, he smiled ironically, pretending that he knew nothing at all, and that he was perfectly astonished at finding that the prisoner, whom he had been just informed was to be brought before him, was no other than Jesus of Nazareth. Is it possible, he said, is it possible that thou art Jesus of Nazareth? Where are thy disciples, thy numerous followers? Where is thy kingdom? I fear affairs have not turned out as thou didst expect. The authorities, I presume, discovered that it was quite time to put a stop to thy conduct, disrespectful as it was, towards God and his priests, and to such violations of the Sabbath. What disciples hast thou now? Where are they all gone? Thou art silent? Speak out, seducer! Speak out, thou inciter of rebellion! Didst thou not eat the paschal lamb in an unlawful manner, at an improper time, and in an improper place? Didst thou not desire to introduce new doctrines? Who gave thee the right of preaching? Where didst thou study? Speak, what are the tenets of thy religion? Jesus then raised his weary head, looked at Annas, and said, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple whither all the Jews resort, and in secret I have spoken nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them who have heard what I have spoken unto them. Behold, they know what things I have said. At this answer of Jesus, the countenance of Annas flushed with fury and indignation. A base menial who was standing near perceived this, and he immediately struck our Lord in the face with his iron gauntlet, exclaiming at the same moment, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus was so nearly prostrated by the violence of the blow, that when the guards likewise reviled and struck him, he fell quite down, and blood trickled from his face onto the floor. Laughter, insults, and bitter words resounded through the hall. The archers dragged him roughly up again, and he mildly answered, If I have spoken evil, give testimony of the evil, but if well, why strikest thou me? Annas became still more enraged when he saw the calm demeanor of Jesus, and turning to the witnesses, he desired them to bring forward their accusations. They all began to speak at once. He has called himself king. He says that God is his father, that the Pharisees are an adulterous generation. He causes insurrections among the people, he cures the sick by the help of the devil on the Sabbath day. The inhabitants of Ophel assembled round him a short time ago and addressed him by the titles of Savior and Prophet. He lets himself be called the Son of God. He says that he is sent by God. He predicts the destruction of Jerusalem. He does not fast. He eats with sinners, with pagans, and with publicans and associates with women of evil repute. A short time ago he said to a man who gave him some water to drink at the gates of Ophel, that he would give unto him the waters of eternal life, after drinking which he would thirst no more. 
He seduces the people by words of double meaning, etc., etc. These accusations were all vociferated at once. Some of the witnesses stood before Jesus and insulted him, while some spoke with derisive gestures, and the archers went so far as even to strike him, saying at the same time, Speak, why dost thou not answer? Annas and his adherents added mockery to insult, exclaiming at every pause in the accusations, This is thy doctrine, then, is it? What canst thou answer to this? Issue thy orders, great king. Man sent by God, give proofs of thy mission. Who art thou? continued Annas, in a tone of cutting contempt. By whom art thou sent? Art thou the son of an obscure carpenter, or art thou Elias, who was carried up to heaven in a fiery chariot? He is said to be still living, and I have been told that thou canst make thyself invisible when thou pleasest. Perhaps thou art the prophet Malachi, whose words thou dost so frequently quote. Some say that an angel was his father, and that he likewise is still alive. An impostor as thou art could not have a finer opportunity of taking persons in than by passing thyself off as this prophet. Tell me, without further preamble, to what order of kings dost thou belong? Thou art greater than Solomon, at least thou pretendest so to be, and dost even expect to be believed. Be easy, I will no longer refuse the title and the scepter, which are so justly thy due. Annas then called for a sheet of parchment, about a yard in length, and six inches in width. On this he wrote a series of words in large letters, and each word expressed some different accusation which had been brought against our Lord. He then rolled it up, placed it in a little hollow tube, fastened it carefully on the top of a reed, and presented this reed to Jesus, saying at the same time, with a contemptuous sneer, Behold the scepter of thy kingdom, it contains thy titles, as also the account of the honors to which thou art entitled, and thy right to the throne. Take them to the high priest, in order that he may acknowledge thy regal dignity, and treat thee according to thy deserts. Tie the hands of this king, and take him before the high priest. The hands of Jesus, which had been loosened, were then tied across his breast in such a manner as to make him hold the pretended scepter, which contained the accusations of Annas, and he was led to the court of Caiaphas, amidst the hisses, shouts, and blows lavished upon him by the brutal mob. The house of Annas was not more than three hundred steps from that of Caiaphas. There were high walls and common-looking houses on each side of the road, which was lighted up by torches and lanterns placed on poles, and there were numbers of Jews standing about, talking in an angry, excited manner. The soldiers could scarcely make their way through the crowd, and those who had behaved so shamefully to Jesus at the court of Annas continued their insults and base usage during the whole of the time spent in walking to the house of Caiaphas. I saw money given to those who behaved the worst to Jesus, by armed men belonging to the tribunal, and I saw them push out of the way all who looked compassionately at him. The former were allowed to enter the court of Caiaphas. Chapter 7. The Tribunal of Caiaphas To enter Caiaphas's tribunal, persons had to pass through a large court, which we will call the exterior court. From thence they entered into an inner court, which extended all around the building. The building itself was of far greater length than breadth, and in the front there was a kind of open vestibule, surrounded on three sides by columns of no great height. On the fourth side the columns were higher, and behind them was a room almost as large as the vestibule itself, where the seats of the members of the council were placed on a species of round platform raised above the level of the floor. That assigned to the high priest was elevated above the others. The criminal to be tried stood in the center of the half-circle formed by the seats. 
the witnesses and accusers stood either by the side or behind the prisoner there were three doors at the back of the judge's seat which led into another apartment filled likewise with seats this room was used for secret consultation entrances placed on the right and left hand sides of this room opened into the interior court which was round like the back of the building those who left the room by the door on the right hand side saw on the left hand side of the court the gate which led to a subterranean prison excavated under the room there were many underground prisons there and it was in one of these that peter and john were confined a whole night when they had cured the lame man in the temple after pentecost both the house and the courts were filled with torches and lamps which made them as light as day there was a large fire lighted in the middle of the porch on each side of which were hollow pipes to serve as chimneys for the smoke and round this fire were standing soldiers menial servants and witnesses of the lowest class who had received bribes for giving their false testimony a few women were there likewise whose employment was to pour out a species of red beverage for the soldiers and to bake cakes for which services they received a small compensation the majority of the judges were already seated around caiaphas the others came in shortly afterwards and the porch was almost filled between true and false witnesses while many other persons likewise endeavored to come in to gratify their curiosity but were prevented peter and john entered the outer court in the dress of travelers a short time before jesus was led through and john succeeded in penetrating into the inner court by means of a servant with whom he was acquainted the door was instantly closed after him therefore peter who was a little behind was shut out he begged the maidservant to open the door for him but she refused both his entreaties and those of john and he must have remained on the outside had not nicodemus and joseph of arimathea who came up at this moment taken him in with them the two apostles then returned the cloaks which they had borrowed and stationed themselves in a place from whence they could see the judges and hear everything that was going on caiaphas was seated in the center of the raised platform and seventy of the members of the sanhedrin were placed around him while the public officers the scribes and the ancients were standing on either side and the false witnesses behind them soldiers were posted from the base of the platform to the door of the vestibule through which jesus was to enter the countenance of caiaphas was solemn in the extreme but the gravity was accompanied by unmistakable signs of suppressed rage and sinister intentions he wore a long mantle of a dull red color embroidered in flowers and trimmed with gold fringe it was fastened at the shoulders and on the chest besides being ornamented in the front with gold clasps his head attire was high and adorned with hanging ribbons the sides were open and it rather resembled a bishop's mitre caiaphas had been waiting with his adherents belonging to the great council for some time and so impatient was he that he arose several times went into the outer court in his magnificent dress and asked angrily whether jesus of nazareth was come when he saw the procession drawing near he returned to his seat chapter eight jesus before caiaphas jesus was led across the court and the mob received him with groans and hisses as he passed by peter and john he looked at them but without turning his head for fear of betraying them scarcely had he reached the council chamber than caiaphas exclaimed in a loud tone thou art come then at last thou enemy of god thou blasphemer who dost disturb the peace of this holy night the tube which contained the accusation of annas and was fastened to the pretended sceptre in the hands of jesus was instantly open and read caiaphas made use of the most insulting language and the archers again struck and abused our lord vociferating at the same time answer at once 
Speak out, art thou dumb? Caiaphas, whose temper was indescribably proud and arrogant, became even more enraged than Annas had been, and asked a thousand questions, one after the other. But Jesus stood before him in silence and with his eyes cast down. The archers endeavored to force him to speak by repeated blows, and a malicious child pressed his thumb into his lips, tauntingly bidding him to bite. The witnesses were then called for. The first were persons of the lowest class, whose accusations were as incoherent and inconsistent as those brought forward at the court of Annas, and nothing could be made out of them. Caiaphas, therefore, turned to the principal witnesses, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who had assembled from all parts of the country. They endeavored to speak calmly, but their faces and manner betrayed the virulent envy and hatred with which their hearts were overflowing, and they repeated over and over again the same accusations, to which he had already replied so many times. That he cured the sick and cast out devils by the help of the devils, that he profaned the Sabbath, incited the people to rebel, called the Pharisees a race of vipers and adulterers, predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, frequented the society of publicans and sinners, assembled the people and gave himself out as a king, a prophet, and the son of God. They deposed. That he was constantly speaking of his kingdom, that he forbade divorce, called himself the bread of life, and said that whoever did not eat his flesh and drink his blood would not have eternal life. Thus did they distort and misinterpret the words he had uttered, the instructions he had given, and the parables by which he had illustrated his instructions, giving them the semblance of crimes. But these witnesses could not agree in their depositions, for one said, He calls himself king and a second instantly contradicted, saying, No, he allows persons to call him so, but directly they attempted to proclaim him, he fled. Another said, He calls himself the Son of God. But he was interrupted by a fourth who exclaimed, No, he only styles himself the Son of God because he does the will of his heavenly Father. Some of the witnesses stated that he had cured them, but that their diseases had returned, and that his pretended cures were only performed by magic. They spoke likewise of the cure of the paralytic man at the pool at Bethsaida, but they distorted the facts so as to give them the semblance of crimes, and even in these accusations they could not agree, contradicting one another. The Pharisees of Sephorus, with whom he had once had a discussion on the subject of divorces, accused him of teaching false doctrines, and a young man of Nazareth, whom he had refused to allow to become one of his disciples, was likewise base enough to bear witness against him. It was found to be utterly impossible to prove a single fact, and the witnesses appeared to come forward for the sole purpose of insulting Jesus, rather than to demonstrate the truth of their statements. Whilst they were disputing with one another, Caiaphas and some of the other members of the council employed themselves in questioning Jesus and turning his answers into derision. What species of king art thou? Give proofs of thy power. Call the legions of angels of whom thou didst speak in the Garden of Olives. What hast thou done with the money given unto thee by the widows and other simpletons whom thou didst seduce by thy false doctrines? Answer at once, speak out. Art thou dumb? Thou wouldst have been far wiser to have kept silence when in the midst of the foolish mob, there thou didst speak far too much. All these questions were accompanied by blows from the underservants of the members of the tribunal, and had our Lord not been supported from above, he could not have survived this treatment. 
Some of the base witnesses endeavored to prove that he was an illegitimate son, but others declared that his mother was a pious virgin belonging to the temple, and that they afterwards saw her betrothed to a man who feared God. The witnesses upbraided Jesus and his disciples with not having offered sacrifice in the temple. It is true that I never did see either Jesus or his disciples offer any sacrifice in the temple, excepting the Paschal Lamb. But Joseph and Anna used frequently during their lifetime to offer sacrifice for the child Jesus. However, even this accusation was puerile, for the Essenes never offered sacrifice, and no one thought the less well of them for not doing so. The enemies of Jesus still continue to accuse him of being a sorcerer, and Caiaphas affirmed several times that the confusion in the statements of the witnesses was caused solely by witchcraft. Some said that he had eaten the paschal lamb on the previous day, which was contrary to the law, and that the year before he had made different alterations in the manner of celebrating the ceremony. But the witnesses contradicted one another to such a degree that Caiaphas and his adherents found, to their very great annoyance and anger, that not one accusation could be really proved. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were called up, and being commanded to say how it happened that they had allowed him to eat the pasch on the wrong day, in a room which belonged to them, they proved from ancient documents that from time immemorial, the Galileans had been allowed to eat the Pasch a day earlier than the rest of the Jews. They added that every other part of the ceremony had been performed according to the directions given in the law, and that persons belonging to the temple were present at the supper. This quite puzzled the witnesses, and Nicodemus increased the rage of the enemies of Jesus by pointing out the passages in the archives which proved the right of the Galileans, and gave the reason for which this privilege was granted. The reason was this. The sacrifices would not have been finished by the Sabbath if the immense multitudes who congregated together for that purpose had all been obliged to perform the ceremony on the same day. And although the Galileans had not always profited by this right, yet its existence was incontestably proved by Nicodemus, and the anger of the Pharisees was heightened by his remarking that the members of the council had cause to be greatly offended at the gross contradictions in the statements of the witnesses, and that the extraordinary and hurried manner in which the whole affair had been conducted showed that malice and envy were the sole motives which incited the accusers, and made them bring the case forward at a moment when all were busied in the preparations for the most solemn feast of the year. They looked at Nicodemus furiously and could not reply, but continued to question the witnesses in a still more precipitate and imprudent manner. Two witnesses at last came forward and said, This man said, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another not made with hands. However, even these witnesses did not agree in their statements, for one said that the accused wished to build a new temple, and that he had eaten the pasch in an unusual place, because he desired the destruction of the ancient temple. But the other said, not so. The edifice where he eat the pasch was built by human hands, therefore he could not have referred to that. The wrath of Caiaphas was indescribable, for the cruel treatment which Jesus had suffered, his divine patience, and the contradictions of the witnesses were beginning to make a great impression on many persons present. A few hisses were heard, and the hearts of some were so touched that they could not silence the voice of their consciences. Ten soldiers left the court under pretext of indisposition, but in reality overcome by their feelings. As they passed by the place where Peter and John were standing, they exclaimed, The silence of Jesus of Nazareth in the midst of such cruel treatment is superhuman. It would melt a heart of iron. The wonder is 
that the earth does not open and swallow up such reprobates as his accusers must be. But tell us, where must we go? The two apostles either mistrusted the soldiers and thought they were only seeking to betray them, or they were fearful of being recognized by those around and denounced as disciples of Jesus, for they only made answer in a melancholy tone. If truth calls you, follow it, and all will come right of itself. The soldiers instantly went out of the room and left Jerusalem soon after. They met persons on the outskirts of town who directed them to the caravans which lay to the south of Jerusalem, on the other side of Mount Sion, where many of the apostles had taken refuge. These latter were at first alarmed at seeing strangers enter their hiding place, but the soldiers soon dispelled all fear and gave them an account of the sufferings of Jesus. The temper of Caiaphas, which was already perturbed, became quite infuriated by the contradictory statements of the two last witnesses, and rising from his seat, he approached Jesus and said, Answerest thou nothing to these things, which these witness against thee? Jesus neither raised his head or looked at the high priest, which increased the anger of the latter to the greatest degree, and the archers perceiving this, seized our Lord by the hair, pulled his head back, and gave him blows under the chin. But still he kept his eyes cast down. Caiaphas raised his hands and exclaimed in an enraged tone, I abjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us, if thou be Christ the Messiah, the Son of the living God. A momentary and solemn pause ensued. Then Jesus, in a majestic and superhuman voice, replied, Thou hast said it. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power of God and coming in the clouds of heaven. Whilst Jesus was pronouncing these words, a bright light appeared to me to surround him. Heaven was opened above his head. I saw the Eternal Father, but no words from a human pen can describe the intuitive view that was then vouchsafed me of him. I likewise saw the angels and the prayers of the just ascending to the throne of God. At the same moment, I perceived the yawning abyss of hell, like a fiery meteor at the feet of Caiaphas. It was filled with horrible devils. A slight gauze alone appeared to separate him from its dark flames. I could see the demoniacal fury with which his heart was overflowing, and the whole house looked to me like hell. At the moment that our Lord pronounced the solemn words, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hell appeared to be shaken from one extremity to the other, and then, as it were, to burst forth and inundate every person in the house of Caiaphas with feelings of redoubled hatred towards our Lord. These things were always shown to me under the appearance of some material object, which renders them less difficult of comprehension and impresses them in a more clear and forcible manner on the mind, because we ourselves, being material beings, facts are more easily illustrated in our regard if manifested through the medium of the senses. The despair and fury which these words produced in hell were shown to me under the appearance of a thousand terrific figures in different places. I remember seeing, among other frightful things, a number of little black objects, like dogs with claws, which walked on their hind legs. I knew at the time what kind of wickedness was indicated by this apparition, but I cannot remember now. I saw these horrible phantoms enter into the bodies of the greatest part of the bystanders, or else place themselves on their head or shoulders. I likewise at this moment saw frightful specters come out of the sepulchres on the other side of Sion. I believe they were evil spirits. I saw in the neighborhood of the temple many other apparitions which resemble prisoners loaded with chains. I do not know whether they were demons or souls condemned to remain in some particular part of the earth 
and who were then going to limbo, which our Lord's condemnation to death had opened to them. It is extremely difficult to explain these facts, for fear of scandalizing those who have no knowledge of such things, but persons who see, feel them, and they often cause the very hair to stand an end on the head. I think that John saw some of these apparitions, for I heard him speak about them afterwards. All whose hearts were not radically corrupted felt excessively terrified at these events, but the hardened were sensible of nothing but an increase of hatred and anger against our Lord. Caiaphas then arose, and urged on by Satan, took up the end of his mantle, pierced it with his knife, and rent it from one end to the other, exclaiming at the same time in a loud voice, he has blasphemed. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard the blasphemy. What think you? All who were then present arose and exclaimed with astonishing malignancy, He is guilty of death. During the whole of this frightful scene, the devils were in the most tremendous state of excitement. They appeared to have complete possession not only of the enemies of Jesus, but likewise of their partisans and cowardly followers. The powers of darkness seemed to me to proclaim a triumph over the light, and the few among the spectators, whose hearts still retained a glimmer of light, were filled with such consternation that, covering their heads, they instantly departed. The witnesses who belonged to the upper classes were less hardened than the others. Their consciences were racked with remorse, and they followed the example given by the persons mentioned above, and left the room as quickly as possible, while the rest crowded round the fire in the vestibule, and ate and drank after receiving full pay for their services. The priest then addressed the archers and said, I deliver this king up into your hands. Render the blasphemer the honors which are his due. After these words, he retired with the members of his council into the round room behind the tribunal, which could not be seen from the vestibule. In the midst of the bitter affliction, which inundated the heart of John, his thoughts were with the mother of Jesus. He feared that the dreadful news of the condemnation of her son might be communicated to her suddenly, or that perhaps some enemy might give the information in a heartless manner. He therefore looked at Jesus, and saying in a low voice, Lord, thou knowest why I leave thee, went away quickly to seek the Blessed Virgin, as if he had been sent by Jesus himself. Peter was quite overcome between anxiety and sorrow, which, joined with fatigue, made him chilly. Therefore, as the morning was cold, he went up to the fire, where many of the common people were warming themselves. He did his best to hide his grief in their presence, as he could not make up his mind to go home and leave his beloved master. Chapter 9. The Insults Received by Jesus in the Court of Caiaphas No sooner did Caiaphas, with the other members of the council, leave the tribunal than a crowd of miscretants, the very scum of the people, surrounded Jesus like a swarm of infuriated wasps and began to speak every imaginable insult upon him. Even during the trial, whilst the witnesses were speaking, the archers and some others could not restrain their cruel inclinations, but pulled out handfuls of his hair and beard, spat upon him, struck him with their fists, wounded him with sharp-pointed sticks, and even ran needles into his body. But when Caiaphas left the hall, they set no bounds to their barbarity. They first placed a crown, made of straw and the bark of trees, upon his head, and then took it off, saluting him at the same time with insulting expressions like the following, Behold the son of David wearing the crown of his father! A greater than Solomon is here. This is the king who is preparing a wedding feast for his son. Thus did they turn into ridicule those eternal truths which he had taught under the form of parables to those whom he came from heaven to save, 
and whilst repeating these scoffing words, they continued to strike him with their fists and sticks, and to spit in his face. Next they put a crown of reeds upon his head, took off his robe and scapular, and then threw an old torn mantle, which scarcely reached his knees, over his shoulders. Around his neck they hung a long iron chain, with an iron ring at each end, studded with sharp points, which bruised and tore his knees as he walked. They again pinioned his arms, put a reed into his hands, and inundated his divine countenance with spittle. They had already thrown all sorts of filth over his hair, as well as over his chest, and upon the old mantle. They bound his eyes with a dirty rag and struck him, crying out at the same time in loud tones, Prophesy unto us, O Christ, who is he that struck thee? He answered not one word, but sighed, and prayed inwardly for them. After many more insults, they seized the chain which was hanging on his neck, dragged him towards the room into which the council had withdrawn, and with their sticks forced in him, vociferating at the same time, March forward, thou king of straw! Show thyself to the council with the insignia of the regal honors we have rendered unto thee. A large body of counselors, with Caiaphas at their head, were still in the room, and they looked with both delight and approbation at the shameful scene which was enacted, beholding with pleasure the most sacred ceremonies turned into derision. The pitiless guards covered him with mud and spittle, and with mock gravity exclaimed, Receive the prophetic unction, the regal unction. Then they impiously parodied the baptismal ceremonies and the pious act of Magdalene in emptying the vase of perfume on his head. How canst thou presume, they exclaimed, to appear before the council in such a condition Thou dost purify others, and thou art not pure thyself, but we will soon purify thee. They fetched a basin of dirty water, which they poured over his face and shoulders, whilst they bent their knees before him and exclaimed, Behold thy precious unction, behold the spikenard, worth three hundred pence. Thou hast been baptized in the pool of Bethsaida. They intended by this to throw into ridicule the act of respect and veneration shown by Magdalene when she poured the precious ointment over his head at the house of the Pharisee. By their derisive words concerning his baptism in the pool of Bethsaida, they pointed out, although unintentionally, the resemblance between Jesus and the Paschal Lamb, for the lambs were washed in the first place in the pool near the Probatica Gate and then brought to the pool of Bethsaida, where they underwent another purification, before being taken to the temple to be sacrificed. The enemies of Jesus likewise alluded to the man who had been infirm for thirty-eight years, and who was cured by Jesus at the pool of Bethsaida. For I saw this man either washed or baptized there. I say either washed or baptized, because I do not exactly remember the circumstances. They then dragged Jesus round the room before all the members of the council who continued to address him in reproachful and abusive language. Every countenance looked diabolical and enraged, and all around was dark, confused, and terrific. Our Lord, on the contrary, was from the moment that he declared himself to be the Son of God, generally surrounded with a halo of light. Many of the assembly appeared to have a confused knowledge of this fact, and to be filled with consternation at perceiving that neither outrages nor ignominies could alter the majestic expression of his countenance. The halo which shone round Jesus from the moment he declared himself to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, served but to incite his enemies to greater fury, and yet it was so resplendent that they could not look at it, and I believe their intention in throwing the dirty rag over his head was to deaden its brightness. Chapter 10. The Denial of St. Peter 
At the moment when Jesus uttered the words, Thou hast said it, and the high priest rent his garment, the whole room resounded with tumultuous cries. Peter and John, who had suffered intensely during the scene which had just been enacted, and which they had been obliged to witness in silence, could bear the sight no longer. Peter therefore got up to leave the room, and John followed soon after. The latter went to the Blessed Virgin, who was in the house of Martha, with the holy women. But Peter's love for Jesus was so great that he could not make up his mind to leave him. His heart was bursting, and he wept bitterly, although he endeavored to restrain and hide his tears. It was impossible for him to remain in the tribunal, as his deep emotion at the sight of his beloved master's sufferings would have betrayed him. Therefore he went into the vestibule and approached the fire, around which soldiers and common people were sitting and talking in the most heartless and disgusting manner concerning the sufferings of Jesus, and related all that they themselves had done to him. Peter was silent, but his silence and dejected demeanor made the bystanders suspect something. The portress came up to the fire in the midst of the conversation, cast a bold glance at Peter, and said, Thou also was with Jesus the Galilean. These words startled and alarmed Peter. He trembled at what might ensue if he owned the truth before his brutal companions, and therefore answered quickly, Woman, I know him not got up and left the vestibule. At this moment, the cock crowed somewhere in the outskirts of the town. I do not remember hearing it, but I felt that it was crowing. As he went out, another maidservant looked at him and said to those who were with her, This man was also with him. And the persons she addressed immediately demanded of Peter whether her words were true, saying, Art thou not one of this man's disciples? Peter was even more alarmed than before, and renewed his denial in these words. I am not, I know not the man. He left the inner court and entered the exterior court. He was weeping, and so great was his anxiety and grief that he did not reflect in the least on the words he had just uttered. The exterior court was quite filled with persons, and some had climbed on top of the wall to listen to what was going on in the inner court, which they were forbidden to enter. A few of the disciples were likewise there, for their anxiety concerning Jesus was so great that they could not make up their minds to remain concealed in the caves of Hinnom. They came up to Peter, and with many tears questioned him concerning their loved master, but he was so unnerved and so fearful of betraying himself that he briefly recommended them to go away as it was dangerous to remain and left them instantly. He continued to indulge his violent grief while they hastened to leave the town. I recognized among these disciples who were about 16 in number, Bartholomew, Nathaniel, Saturnius, Judas Barsabbas, Simon, who was afterwards Bishop of Jerusalem, Zacchaeus, and Manahem, the man who was born blind and cured by our Lord. Peter could not rest anywhere, and his love for Jesus prompted him to return to the inner court, which he was allowed to enter, because Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had, in the first instance, taken him in. He did not re-enter the vestibule, but turned to the right and went towards the round room which was behind the tribunal, in which Jesus was undergoing every possible insult and ignominy from his cruel enemies. Peter walked timidly up to the door, and although perfectly conscious that he was suspected by all present of being a partisan of Jesus, yet he could not remain outside. His love for his master impelled him forward, he entered the room, advanced, and soon stood in the very midst of the brutal throng who were feasting their cruel eyes on the sufferings of Jesus. They were at that moment dragging him ignominiously backwards and forwards with the crown of straw upon his head. He cast a sorrowful and even severe glance upon Peter, which cut him to the heart, but as he was still much alarmed and at that moment 
heard some of the bystanders call out, Who is that man? He went back again into the court, and seeing that the persons in the vestibule were watching him, came up to the fire and remained before it for some time. Several persons who had observed his anxious, troubled countenance began to speak in opprobrious terms of Jesus, and one of them said to him, Thou also art one of his disciples, thou also art a Galilean, thy very speech betrays thee. Peter got up, intending to leave the room, when a brother of Malchus came up to him and said, Did I not see thee in the garden with him? Didst thou not cut off my brother's ear? Peter became almost beside himself with terror. He began to curse and to swear that he knew not the man and ran out of the vestibule into the outer court. The cock then crowed again, and Jesus, who at that moment was led across the court, cast a look of mingled compassion and grief upon his apostle. This look of our Lord pierced Peter to the very heart. It recalled to his mind, in the most forceful and terrible manner, the words addressed to him by our Lord on the previous evening. Before the cock crows twice, thou shalt thrice deny me. He had forgotten all of his promises and protestations to our Lord that he would die rather than deny him. He had forgotten the warning given to him by our Lord. But when Jesus looked at him, he felt the enormity of his fault, and his heart was nigh bursting with grief. He had denied his Lord when that beloved master was outraged insulted, delivered up into the hands of unjust judges, when he was suffering all in patience and in silence. His feelings of remorse were beyond expression. He returned to the exterior court, covered his face, and wept bitterly. All fear of being recognized was over. He was ready to proclaim to the whole universe both his fault and his repentance. What man will dare assert that he would have shown more courage than Peter if with his quick and ardent temperament he were exposed to such danger, trouble, and sorrow at a moment, too, when completely unnerved between fear and grief and exhausted by the sufferings of this sad night? Our Lord left Peter to his own strength, and he was weak, like all who forget the words. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Chapter 11 Mary in the House of Caiaphas The Blessed Virgin was ever united to her Divine Son by interior spiritual communications. She was, therefore, fully aware of all that happened to him. She suffered with him and joined in continual prayer for his murderers. But her maternal feelings prompted her to supplicate Almighty God most ardently not to suffer the crime to be completed and to save her son from such dreadful torments. She eagerly desired to return to him, and when John, who had left the tribunal at the moment the frightful cry, He is guilty of death, was raised, came to the house of Lazarus, to see after her, and to relate the particulars of the dreadful scene he had just witnessed. She, as also Magdalene and some of the other holy women, begged to be taken to the place where Jesus was suffering. John, who had only left our Savior, in order to console her whom he loved best next to his divine Master, instantly acceded to their request and conducted them through the streets, which were lighted up by the moon alone, and crowded with persons hastening to their homes. The holy women were closely veiled, but the sobs which they could not restrain made many who passed by observe them, and their feelings were harrowed by the abuse of epithets they overheard bestowed upon Jesus by those who were conversing on the subject of his arrest. The Blessed Virgin, whoever beheld in spirit, the opprobrious treatment which her dear son was receiving continued to lay up all these things in her heart. Like him, she suffered in silence, but more than once she became totally unconscious. 
Some disciples of Jesus, who were returning from the hall of Caiaphas, saw her fainting in the arms of the holy women, and touched with pity, stopped to look at her compassionately, and saluted her in these words, Hail, unhappy mother! Hail, mother of the most holy one of Israel, the most afflicted of all mothers! Mary raised her head, thanked them graciously, and continued her sad journey. When in the vicinity of Caiaphas's house, their grief was renewed by the sight of a group of men, who were busily occupied under a tent, making the cross ready for our Lord's crucifixion. The enemies of Jesus had given orders that the cross should be prepared directly after his arrest, that they might without delay execute the sentence, which they hoped to persuade Pilate to pass on him. The Romans had already prepared the crosses of the two thieves, and the workmen who were making that of Jesus were much annoyed at being obliged to labor at it during the night. They did not attempt to conceal their anger at this, and uttered the most frightful oaths and curses, which pierced the heart of the tender mother of Jesus through and through. But she prayed for these blind creatures, who thus unknowingly blasphemed the Savior, who was about to die for their salvation, and prepared the cross for his cruel execution. Mary, John, and the holy women traversed the outer court attached to Caiaphas's house. They stopped under the archway of a door, which opened into the inner court. Mary's heart was with her divine son, and she desired most ardently to see this door open, that she might again have a chance of beholding him, for she knew that it alone separated her from the prison where he was confined. The door was at length opened, and Peter rushed out, his face covered with his mantle, wringing his hands and weeping bitterly. By the light of the torches he soon recognized John and the Blessed Virgin, but the sight of them only renewed those dreadful feelings of remorse which the look of Jesus had awakened in his breast. Mary approached him instantly and said, Simon, tell me, I entreat you, what has become of Jesus, my son? These words pierced his very heart. He could not even look at her, but turned away and again wrung his hands. Mary drew close to him and said in a voice trembling with emotion, Simon, son of John, why dost thou not answer me? Mother, exclaimed Peter in a dejected tone, O oh, mother, speak not to me. Thy son is suffering more than words can express. Speak not to me. They have condemned him to death, and I have denied him three times. John came up to ask a few more questions, but Peter ran out of the court as if beside himself, and did not stop for a single moment until he reached the cave at Mount Olivet, that cave on the stones of which the impression of the hands of our Savior had been miraculously left. I believe it is the cave in which Adam took refuge to weep after his fall. The Blessed Virgin was inexpressibly grieved at hearing of the fresh pang inflicted on the loving heart of her divine son, the pang of hearing himself denied by that disciple who had first acknowledged him as the son of the living God. She was unable to support herself and fell down on the door stone, upon which the impression of her feet and hands remain to the present day. I have seen the stones, which are preserved somewhere, but I cannot at this moment remember where. The door was not again shut, for the crowd was dispersing, and when the Blessed Virgin came to herself, she begged to be taken to some place as near as possible to her divine son. John, therefore, led her and the holy women to the front of the prison where Jesus was confined. Mary was with Jesus in spirit, and Jesus was with her, but this loving mother wished to hear with her own ears the voice of her divine son. She listened and heard not only his moans, but also the abusive language of those around him. It was impossible for the holy women to remain in the court any longer without attracting attention. The grief of Magdalene was so violent that she was unable to conceal it, 
and although the Blessed Virgin, by a special grace from Almighty God, maintained a calm and dignified exterior in the midst of her sufferings, yet even she was recognized and overheard harsh words such as these. Is that not the mother of the Galilean? Her son will most certainly be executed, but not before the festival, unless indeed he is the greatest of criminals. The Blessed Virgin left the court and went up to the fireplace in the vestibule, where a certain number of persons were still standing. When she reached the spot where Jesus had said that he was the Son of God, and the wicked Jews cried out, He is guilty of death! She again fainted, and John and the holy women carried her away, in appearance more like a corpse than a living person. The bystanders said not a word. They seemed struck with astonishment, and silence, such as might have been produced in hell by the passage of a celestial being, reigned in that vestibule. The holy women again passed the place where the cross was being prepared. The workmen appeared to find as much difficulty in completing it as the judges had found in pronouncing the sentence, and were obliged to fetch fresh wood every moment, for some bits would not fit, and others split. This continued until the different species of wood were placed in the cross, according to the intentions of divine providence. I saw angels who obliged these men to recommence their work, and who would not let them rest until all was accomplished in a proper manner, but my remembrance of this vision is indistinct.